window dressing, cooking the books, uh, pulling strings. It's one of the great myths of informality that it's aso it is associated with underdevelopment or poverty or survival. You know, because informal networks and informal workings are needed when you cannot get something through formal channels in economically um, efficient way. One, one assumes that once society becomes a mature development and a mature market, um, informality stops being functional and is not so necessary. So what we argue, that it's not quite like that. That's where we thought it would be fascinating for our Global Informality Project to look at the old Europe, at societies which are best developed, at the United States. And what we discover is a fascinating range of informal practices. We are basically going around the globe, uh, starting in Europe, but spreading um, outwards to identify those practices that allow people to maintain their everyday needs, their regular needs, their life cycle needs, the needs of their families and friends. And it's been fascinating to see how many parallels we find uh, between societies which are on very different level of development, on very uh, different level of democratic, institutional framework in terms of development of the markets, but yet we are all humans and we have very interesting fundamental patterns. I developed the methodology of looking at things bottom up, grassroots up. Instead of projecting our concepts such as civil society, social capital, institutions onto society, my approach was much more ethnographic. I looked at, not at what didn't work and why, but I looked at what worked and how. Now we have created the world map of informality. So we do, of course, have blood from Russia, but we do have um, a lot of parallel terms. For example, we've got pituto in Chile, uh, we've got Gentijo in Brazil, we've got Guanxi in China. Give and take practices that people do not normally associate with corruption. We are studying corruption without using that concept. So what we are trying to do, we are looking at the practices that are marginal to corruption that may be conducive to the development of corruption. It's like an underbelly of corruption. And of course, our idea is that once we know how the underbelly works, we are going to be better equipped to create a new generation of anti-corruption policies. This is not even a question of devising new generation of policies. I think policies that exist are really good. The trouble is, they don't quite work. Why? Because they very often come into, against the resistance of those local practices and local knowledge that operates there without our understanding.